Well, welcome to our service for the 27th of September. It's wonderful that you've joined us on our YouTube channel. I'm probably sounding very echoey at this moment for I'm standing in our almost completed refurbished church space. Uh, we're very excited about it here at St Stephen's. We're looking forward to the great things that, uh, that we can do with the uh, updated facilities and, uh, and the way that God might use us to reach out into the community. The carpet is going down next week and once the carpet's down, uh, we're waiting on the chairs and a few other bits and pieces. I thought it'd be good to open our service today uh, just to let you know where we're up to and you can see uh, and get an idea behind me about how it's all going. Look, thank you for joining us. Today we continue our topic of prayer and we're thinking about praying our anxieties, bringing our anxieties before God and uh, in this world, in this age, there's no shortage of anxiety. So how do we deal with our anxieties and what's uh, the, the relationship of our anxieties to prayer? Uh, that will be occupying our thinking uh, a little later. Well, let's pray as we commit this time to God. Father, we thank you that we can come together. Uh, we thank you that I can be standing in this almost renovated building. We're almost there. Father, we ask that you would bless this space and that it not be used for our glory, but what we do in here is for your glory. Father, help this building just to, to move outwards and the people within it to move outwards and to be good witnesses for you. And Lord, as we come together and meet together now as a church, we do pray that your spirit would be amongst us. Uh, help us to think clearly, help us to understand your word, and help us to enjoy the fellowship with one another. And we do ask this through your son's name. Amen. Well, we're going to listen to the song now. It's the Zoom choir from Moore College, uh, the wonderful students there, and it's Be Thou My Vision. Uh, so let's worship God together in the word of this terrific song. Yeah. 
Well, as you can see, uh, I've moved back into the church hall. The sound quality is uh, a lot better. Well, as we come and look at this topic of prayer a little later, why don't we pray right now? And we read in Psalm 48, 1. Great is the Lord and highly to be praised. We acknowledge your greatness, O God. You are the everlasting God, the mighty creator, the king of the universe, supreme over all. May the thought of your greatness enter deeply into our hearts to enlarge our vision of you, to enrich our worship of you, to increase our faith in you. You are great indeed, O Lord, and highly to be praised by us and by all creation. And all praise and honour to you, Lord Jesus, the eternal word who took our flesh and became man for our salvation. All praise for your birth and humiliation. All praise for sharing our human life and limitations. All praise for entering into our sufferings and trials. All praise for identifying yourself with our sins and dying for us on the cross. Jesus, Saviour, Redeemer, true God and true man, by the power of your Spirit, we pray these things now as we glorify you forever. Amen. Well, I think it's time to see whether there's any children watching. As I usually do, I'm having a good look down that camera lens. Yes, I think there's always uh, one or two or three or four boys and girls watching. Well, we're going to hear a story today from Quizworks, and it's about Jesus meeting a good man. In fact, this man was really, really good. So good that he thought God would just love him without Jesus. Hmm. I wonder if that's possible. Have a listen to this story. <laughs> beep, beep. <laughs> Hi, everyone. You I'm... can't. You know what? You're not even my friend anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hi, Percival. Oh, no, yeah, hi, Miriam. <sighs> What's going on? But they weren't playing by the rules. Oh. Yeah, yeah, and, and I do not play with anyone who doesn't play by the rules. So what I'm going to do, Miriam, yeah. is I'm going to take my bat and my ball, and I'm going to go home. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry about that. Well, today we are going to be looking at a true story from the Bible about what happened when a good and religious person met Jesus. <laughs> okay, Miriam, I'm back. So yep. I see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everyone, this is my friend Percival. Oh, hi everybody, I am Percival. Well, you seemed pretty upset before. Yes, Miriam. Yes, I was very upset before. And you know why? Why? Well, because me and my friends were playing, but I was the only one playing by the rules. Aww. Everyone else was cheating. And so, they're not my friends anymore. Oh, no. Anyway, Miriam, what are you up to? We are about to watch a true story of what happens when Jesus met someone who was a good guy. A good guy? Yeah. Hey, he sounds like my kind of fella. <laughs> yeah, I bet that Jesus shook his hand and said, congratulations, son, for being such a top bloke. <laughs> well, how about we see, hey? How can people be made right with God? Maybe by being good? Maybe by being religious? Do these things make you right with God? Can we be good enough for God? Nick walked as fast as his old frame would allow. It was dark out and he wanted to get to the house where Jesus was staying as quickly as he could. He saw the light shining from the window. He knocked and waited as he heard footsteps approach. The door swung open and light poured out. Nick, the teacher of God's law, sat in silence, wondering how this discussion would go. Opposite him sat Jesus. Jesus was much younger than Nick, but already he was known as someone who taught about God with great authority. Nick also heard that Jesus had great power. 
Jesus had turned water into wine. Jesus made people who were blind able to see again. Jesus healed people whose legs did not work. Jesus had great power indeed. Finally, Nick spoke. Jesus, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. No one would be able to do the miracles you are doing if God were not with him. Surely this compliment would please Jesus. But as Jesus looked at Nick, he knew that Nick had to change. He knew that his being good was not enough. And so Jesus said to Nick, I tell you the truth. If you want to see God's kingdom, you must be born again. Must be born again? That caught Nick's attention. How can I be born again? Thought Nick. He looked at himself and imagined. Could he fit back inside his mum and be born a second time? Surely not. Then what could Jesus mean? Did Jesus mean that all the good and religious things that Nick did would not be enough? That Nick would have to be changed completely by God to be made right with God? Jesus went on to say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life in his name. A short time later, Jesus, God's only son, was killed on a cross. This is what had to be done for people to be made right with God. But to show that Jesus could offer eternal life for all who would believe in his name, three days later, Jesus was raised back to life again. And so, how can people be made right with God? It's not by being good or by being religious. People need to be changed completely by God to be made right with God. And people are made right with God by believing in Jesus' name. The end. What just happened? Well, what do you mean? Well, Nick was a good and religious guy. Yeah. But that wasn't enough to be right with God? Well, that's what Jesus was saying. <gasps> the Bible says that by themselves, no one can be good enough to be made right with God. Why not? Well, because if we think about it, none of us can live up to even our own standards, never mind God's standards. <laughs> what are you talking about, Miriam? I do. So... You're happy to shout at your friends and tell them that you won't be their friend anymore just because they did something that annoyed you a little bit. Oh, Miriam, there is no way, no way that I would ever do... Oh, wait, uh, that's what I did, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, you did. Oh, man, I can't even live up to my own standards. No, <sighs> when we think carefully about it, None of us do. Oh, this is hopeless, Miriam! But no, it's not. Because Wait, it's not. Jesus taught that if people recognise that they need to be changed by God, yeah. to be made right with God, mm -hmm. then that can happen. If people believe in Jesus, God will allow people to be made right with him. Oh. And he will give us new life. And with that new life, we will still not always get things right, but we can try to live more like the way God wants us to, with his help. Oh, that is great news, Miriam. And you know what I'm going to do? What? Well, I'm, uh, I'm going to get my ball <laughs> and my bat, and I'm going to say sorry to my oh. friend, Miriam. Yeah, hopefully they're going to want to play with me again. Oh, that sounds like a really good idea, Percival. Yeah, okay. <laughs> See you later, Miriam. <laughs> See you. <laughs> well, today we have seen from the Bible that everyone, even really good people, have to be changed by God to be made right with God. Everyone has to believe in Jesus to be made right with God. And you can talk to people you know who do believe in Jesus and you can ask them what it means for them to believe in Jesus. Now, 
I'm going to go and see if Percival will let me play as well. I'll see you next time. Hey, boys and girls, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that story from Quizworks. How good you have to be to be in God's family? Wow, you really need to trust in Jesus. That's the important thing because by trusting in him, God forgives us and allows us into his family. Hey, I tell you what, if you've just watched that Quizworks video, why don't you get your mum or dad or somebody else, your brother or your sister, just to leave a comment on the bottom of the page in the comment section under this video because it'd be really good to know that you're out there. That'd be wonderful. I just thought I'd let you know that I've got the privilege of speaking at a Scripture Union leadership conference uh, coming up in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, we're going to have uh, 20 or 30 um, school teenagers there. Uh, so it's not, it's not a big conference, but it's a very important conference in the life of this region. So I'd just like to put that before you and ask you to pray for it. Uh, there's uh, lots of things happening uh, for these teenagers at that conference. Uh, they'll be hearing uh, Bible talks in the morning. There'll be diff different seminars and discussions that they can participate in. And the aim of the conference is to produce uh, leaders uh, in, in our schools in particular and in our churches that are confident, confident handling the word of God. Uh, I've got the privilege of bringing uh, four morning talks. Uh, they're from the book of Numbers. Uh, I chose that book because it's not uh, a well-known book. I think when most people, let alone teenagers, pick up a book uh, or we ask them what their favourite book is, uh, I don't think Numbers usually appears on the list. So I've chosen the book of Numbers because uh, it's a book usually not known, but it's a wonderful book right, that opens up the plans and purposes of God and it points us to Jesus. And, and so I'll be uh, sharing and, and working through that book and, uh, and standing and, uh, alongside uh, people as we open this book and we see how Moses and Jesus and the wilderness and the book of Hebrews and, and, and lots of other connections between the Old and the New Testament, how it thrusts us forward to Jesus and then from Jesus to us. Uh, so you might like uh, to pray for that conference. Uh, I'm really excited about it. I'm really looking forward to it. And, uh, and we can pray uh, that, uh, that the next generation of leaders right, are godly and committed to the word of God. For that's the aim of the conference, to raise up godly leaders capable of teaching God's word and most importantly, modelling God, godliness in their lives. That's so important these days, not just having that head knowledge, that Bible knowledge, but translating it into real life change. And so we pray that the Spirit of God grabs these teenagers and does something wonderful with them and uses them for the glory of God. Now I'm going to read to us a part of the Bible, and it's from 1 John. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. Well, let's come again in prayer before God. Thank you, Father, for the assurance of these words in 1 John, that if we confess our sins, that you promise to forgive our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. Father, we thank you for the majesty of the cross that, that we are forgiven, that we are being renewed by your spirit, that we are no longer your enemies, but now we are your sons and daughters because the righteousness of your son is now our righteousness, and we praise you for that. Father, this world is a difficult place in which to live in our own hearts, in our own families, in our own towns and cities. There is so much going on that shouldn't be happening. And Father, we ask that you would work within our world, that you would 
transform people as they come to a faith in the Lord Jesus. Father, restrain evil, we pray. Father, give us good government, good civic leaders. And Father, we pray that you would restrain sin not only within our hearts, but within our world. Father, thank you that your gospel is going out into the world. And thank you that it is bearing fruit as you have promised it would. And Father, we pray that we might share and participate in your purposes for this world by our own testimony and by our own witness to others, that people would see us as living letters and that we may, might be signposts pointing them to you. Father, use us, we pray. We don't want to sit on our laurels and just be lazy. Father, lift us up, grab us by the scruff of the neck if you need to. And Father, use us to your honour and glory in obedience to your word. Father, we thank you for the recent rain uh, in our local area here in Tamworth. And we thank you for the relief that this has brought to the farming community. Father, we pray for, uh, for farmers still struggling with debt. And we pray that this season might be one of good crops and healthy stock. And we ask that this farming community might recover. And Father, we pray for the sick and frail, for older age brings its own challenges. So we pray for those who are doing it, who are doing it hard in their older years. Father, we pray that we would end this life well as we head towards our promised home. Father, we need your words. We need to hear your voice. And we need to be encouraged that you will um, stay with us, that your promises will hold firm right to the very end. Father, help us not to be like Israel in the wilderness, rebelling and grumbling and carrying on. But Father, give us a surety that comes uh, from your firm promises. Father, help us to see this world properly. Help us to see that we are passing through. And we pray, Lord that you would uh, just take us and hold us and deliver us home. Father, we pray all these things, knowing that you are our Heavenly Father. We pray that your kingdom come and your will be done. And these things we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, Bruce and Sue are going to read to us from the Bible as we come uh, to look at our topic for this morning, that's praying our anxieties. Uh, so thanks to Bruce and Sue, and I'll see you on the other side of these readings. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm reading Psalm 80. Hear us, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin and Manasseh. Awaken your might, come and save us. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. O Lord God Almighty, how long will your anger smoulder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us a source of contention to our neighbours, and our enemies mock us. Restore us, O God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us, that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its boughs to the sea. It shoots to as far as the river. Why have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by pick its grapes? Boars from the forest ravage it and the creatures of the field feed on it. Return to us, O God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine 
the root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down, it is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. Restore us, O Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. Thank you. Hi folks, my reading today is from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and it's the whole chapter, verses 1 to 12. Paul, Silas and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are always to thank God for you, brothers, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you, and give relief to you who are troubled, and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with, one, with powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marvelled at among all those who have to be have believed. This includes you, because you believed our testimony to you. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may count you worthy of his calling, and that by his power he may fulfil every good purpose of yours, and every act prompted by your faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you, and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. Well, let's pray as we come to God's word. Father, we do thank you that we can look at your word and as we consider this important topic of praying our anxieties, we ask that you would help us to understand uh, what it means uh, to pray our insecurities and help us to think about this in a way that honours you. Amen. Well, the National Church Life Survey, NCLS, is a great tool for looking at the general condition of churches in Australia. Uh, one of the things that they look at in their survey is the mental health of people within the church community. Uh, and using data from the 2016 survey, church leaders identified mental health issues within their churches as the second most important pastoral need that they deal with and the need uh, for mental health support is only increasing. Uh, according to Beyond Blue, anxiety is the most common health condition, mental health condition within Australia, with an, estimate, uh, with an estimate of over two million people who chronically suffer anxiety every day. Anxiety and depression are commonly found together, uh, and as we come to the Bible, we should assure ourselves that God is concerned about our anxieties. We all experience anxiety uh, from time to time. Uh, for many of us, it's just a phase and then it passes. Uh, for some of us, it's more ongoing, but it's a state of mind that we can manage. And for others, it may even require medical intervention. So let's open God's word and take a look at why we should be praying our anxieties. In Philippians 4, 4 to 7, uh, we do not get a, a medical uh, examination and analysis of anxiety, but we realise that the type of anxiety spoken about is the insecurity, unease, discomfort or fear that comes from a lack of faithfulness. 
It is part of our Christian growth that we learn to deal with our insecurities and anxieties in a way that honours the Lord Jesus. I consider that Job was not scolded uh, for um, bearing the brunt of his emotions. Uh, our emotions will take us down paths that we prefer not to travel, yet we need to train our feelings and impose limits, lest our feelings lead us to our positioning of questioning the goodness of God. And it is here that Job overstepped the mark and God corrected him and then rewarded him, rewarded Job for his godliness. Uh, the Psalms lay bare the human emotions of fear, anxiety, depression and insecurity. On his knees in the garden, Jesus prayed his anxieties as he prayed for relief from the burden of the cross. And we can pray our anxieties because God is our Father and he encourages, even demands, that we take our anxieties to him. Uh, the anxieties of which we are speaking about have a spiritual remedy as we throw off our old selves and clothe ourselves in righteousness. And so, arising from Romans 12, 1 to 2, and Philippians 4, 4 to 7, there are four points uh, that we see that help us to deal with our anxieties. And one is that we must adopt a godly mindset. Second, in our anxieties, we must have none about anything. And then thirdly, as we pray over the anxieties of life, we are to always pray with thanksgiving. And then fourthly, we must pray about everything. So four points for us this morning. Adopt a godly mindset. Uh, in our anxieties, we must have none about anything. And as we pray over the anxieties of life, we are always to pray uh, with an attitude of thanksgiving. And then lastly, as Philippians says, we must pray about everything. So let's have a look at each of these points in turn. First, adopt a godly mindset. As we allow our minds to be changed and renewed, our anxieties find a fresh perspective. This thought arises from Romans 12. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. We can present our bodies to the Lord as genuinely holy and acceptable sacrifices only if we do not conform to the image of this world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. And so we must resist the pressure to be squeezed into the mould of this world and the patterns of behaviour that typify it. Do not conform to this world. Uh, when I was growing up, it was often thought that uh, activities such as smoking and drinking and dancing and playing cards were worldly vices that needed to be avoided. Uh, a Christian girl would say, I don't smoke, I don't chew, and I don't go with boys who do. So to think of worldliness, though, in this way trivialises the problem. The worldliness we are to break away from is this world's worldview. We are to break out of this world's way of thinking and let our minds be moulded by the word of God. In broad terms, the Western world's way of thinking can be uh, classed as secular humanism. Humanism is opposed to God and it's hostile to the gospel. And this is particularly seen in public statements and particularly uh, one uh, coined in 1933 in a statement called a human manifesto. And this document said, traditional theism, especially faith in the prayer hearing God, assumed to love and care for persons, to hear and understand their prayers and to be able to do something about them, is an unproved and outmoded faith. Salvationism, based on mere affirmation, still appears as harmful, diverting people with false hopes of heaven hereafter. Reasonable minds look to other means for survival. And that's the mindset in broad terms of this world. The poet T.S. Eliot wrote an epitaph for our materialistic generation. Here were decent, godless people, their only monument, the asphalt road, and a thousand lost golf balls. 
Do not be conformed to the mindset of this age, to the patterns of this world. This is a mindless age, and yet the gospel calls us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. The renewing of our minds is the restoration of our person created in the image of God. It's becoming like Jesus, the man perfectly bearing the image of our creator. And as we are transformed by the renewing of our minds, we grow in holiness and we become like God who is holy. And the Bible writers time and time again urge us, even push us towards holiness. 1 Thessalonians 4.3. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should be, become holy. Colossians 3. Put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature. As God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility. Put on love. The renewing mind is equipped to pray when confronted with the anxieties of life. As we immerse ourselves in God thought, God's thoughts and change our view of the world, we can learn that some of the things that make us anxious are no reasons for anxiety at all. I remember feeling uh, a great deal of anxiety as I was heading through my engineering degree. Uh, what if I failed? What if I couldn't be an engineer? What would I do? I would think myself to be a failure. But when I went to the Bible, when I looked at God's word, my thinking about work was transformed. Passages such as 2 Thessalonians 3 are clear. We work so not to be idle and disruptive. We work so not to be a burden on others. We work because God himself is a worker, and so as we work, we honour God. I could find nowhere in the Bible that says I need to be an engineer. I could be a sewage worker and be godly and, and not a burden to others. <laughs> and as it ended up, I became a sewage worker with an engineering degree. An understanding of God's view of work would have relieved many and anxiety for me. A godly wisdom equips us to deal with the anxieties of life. And so as the word of God renews our minds, we come to know which matters matter, and we come to know which matters don't matter. Well, second, in our anxieties, we must have none about anything. Uh, turn over uh, to Philippians 4, 6 to 7. These few words we've become familiar with over the last few weeks. Uh, it's an amazing thought, but Philippians 4 is very clear. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Prayer is God's response to our anxieties. Uh, we're troubled by many things. You may be troubled by your work, your family, uh, the future, money, health, happiness. God invites you to put all your requests and your burdens about these things before him in prayer. Indeed, he commands you not to be anxious about anything and take the alternate option of prayer. When Israel were travelling through the wilderness. They didn't trust God's promises. Uh, but had God ever let Israel down? Had God ever slipped up in the past or changed his mind? No, of course not. He had not. And yet Israel remained faithful in the present. They doubted that God would provide for their material needs in the wilderness. They feared the future, although God had promised to give them this land of Canaan. There is an anxiety that leads you away from the goodness of God. We need to switch this anxiety off. Our passage says, do not be anxious about anything. Paul's words echo the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body or what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed 
like one of these. We have our houses and we have our food and we have our clothing. We are blessed by God, but we ought not turn those blessings into little gods. For if we do, we imitate the anxieties of our material world and we show a lack of confidence in God's care for his children. Anxiety forces us to lose perspective of reality and God's ongoing, ongoing care for his people. And so anxiety is impractical. Does it change anything? Anxiety reflects a disbelief in God's power to provide for his creation. Anxiety reflects a heart more in tune with material things than spiritual things. Pray your anxieties and then have none about anything. And the story is told of a man who walked uh, merrily down a street with his head raised high and uh, walking along whistling a happy tune. And a friend of his who knew him to be a worrisome fellow stopped him and asked him, why are you so happy? The man replied that he ju just struck a deal with a person who agreed to take on all his cares and worries. That he did not need to worry anymore because his hired helper would do all the worrying for him. Oh, how much did you pay him, his friend asked. Oh, I, I give him $1,000 a week. The man replied, $1,000 a week? The friend was amazed. Where are you going to come up with that sort of money? And the man replied smugly, that's his worry. Turn your anxieties over to the Lord and it will cost you nothing. Third, in our prayers over the anxieties of life, Always pray with thanksgiving. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. In the pain of your anxiety, pray with thanksgiving. Anxiety often leads to complaining and whining and self-pity, but we are to pray with thanksgiving as we present our requests to God. To the Thessalonians, Paul wrote, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. To the Colossians, Paul wrote, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. The regular offering of thanksgiving in our Christian life is essential to a healthy Christian life. Give thanks in all circumstances. Oh, if only Paul was aware of my circumstances, he wouldn't have said such a thing. Paul says, in all circumstances, as you pray, give thanks. Well, how does one give thanks to God uh, in the middle of a German concentration camp or in a cancer ward or where there's a backyard drowning or even when hanging on a Roman cross? Read Corrie ten Boom and you will learn how to give thanks as you present your request to God. Her family died at the hands of the Germans and she was released from Ravensbrück only through a clerical error. And she was later to write these words. The wonderful thing about praying is that you leave a world of not being able to do something and enter God's realm where everything is possible. He specialises in the impossible. Nothing is too great for his almighty power. Nothing is too small for his love. Or read the story of uh, Johnny Erickson Tater, who dived into a pool in 1967 and became a quadriplegic. She wrote, God is more concerned with conforming me to the likeness of his son than leaving me in my comfort zones. God is more interested in inward qualities than outward circumstances. Things like refining my faith, humbling my heart, cleaning up my thought life and strengthening my character. The grounds for our thanksgiving are the mighty works of God in Christ who bring salvation through his gospel. We give thanks for God's grace given to us in Christ. And as we make our requests and petitions known to God, we must be thankful to God for all the good things that he has already given to us. Two men were walking through a field one day when they spotted an enraged bull. Instantly they darted towards the nearest fence. 
off they went. The storming bull was following and hopped his chute, and it was soon apparent that they wouldn't make it to the fence in time. Terrified, one shouted to the other, put up a prayer, John, we're in for it. Well, John answered, I can't, I've never made a public prayer in my life. But you must, shrieked his friend. The bull is catching up to us. All right, panted John, I'll say the only prayer I know, the one my father used to repeat at the table. Oh Lord, for what we are about, we are about to receive, make us truly thankful. There is always a reason to be thankful, because there is always a gospel which assures us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. An attitude of thankfulness to God that makes us look up and remember that we do have a Father in heaven and whatever happens to us, he will keep us secure in Christ Jesus. And then lastly, we must pray about everything. This is what our text says, do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God in everything. Don't leave anything off the prayer list. In every area of life, we can make our anxieties known to our Heavenly Father. You may have had a human father who was not interested in all your worries and cares. You may have worn out your friends, um, burnt their ears too much by pouring your heart out to them so often. But your Heavenly Father is always interested in your worries and anxieties. Remember 1 Peter 5, 6 to 7. Humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. However big, however small, however wide, however deep, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord. Take your anxieties to the Lord in prayer. He is able and he is willing to answer your prayers. Cast your cares upon the Lord like a fisherman casts his line into the pond. And be assured that at the end of your line is your creator and redeemer, the God who saved you, the God who loves you, and the God who cares for you. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are there and that you are loving and you do care about our anxieties and our stresses and our strains and that you encourage, even demand, that we take them to you in prayer and then hand them over to you. Father, we admit our frailty in this area, that, uh, that we doubt your goodness more often than what we should, and we do ask for your forgiveness. Father, transform our minds, we pray, so we are people of prayer, and that so as we pray our anxieties, we can do so with thanksgiving, because we know there is so much to thank you for, and we particularly thank you for the Lord Jesus that in him we have a mediator at your right hand. And we thank you, Father, that your spirit uh, helps us as we groan in our pains to pray to you uh, in a way that is acceptable to you. So, Father, be with us, we pray, in Christ's name. Amen.
Well, thank you for joining us today. I'm so pleased that you could spend this time with us. Uh, it's been great to share with you wherever you are. Um, church is church, and, and although we might be able to meet together all the time, just to be able to come uh, and share with you and to see you on YouTube uh, is a wonderful thing indeed. And we thank God for the technology and the availability of this sort of thing. So, Feel free to join us next week. We'd love to see you. And if you found uh, this service really encouraging, I'd love it uh, if you could subscribe or hit the like button. We'd like to expand our YouTube ministry. And if you think it worthwhile, if you could uh, express your uh, thoughts in this way. So may God be with you this week. And, uh, and we uh, pray that you have a good week. Uh, remain godly. Keep praying. Commit all things to the Lord. And I look forward to seeing you next time.